Edmonton, Alberta, inside an empty arena. This is not the way we hope to see you on this December 29th, where there would have been four games scheduled on the fourth day of the World Juniors, but not to be. As we say hello, Canada, James Duffy and Bob McKenzie with you. The 2022 World Junior Hockey Championship has been cancelled after two more positive tests today, one from a Russian player, one from a Czech player, and thus two more game forfeitures. The IIHF met and has cancelled the tournament. Take us through the events of today that led to this decision. Well, obviously, the IIHF and uh, USA Hockey were still dealing with what went on with the Americans yesterday, having to forfeit a game, forfeit a game and find out whether their game against Sweden was going to be played. But everybody was relatively optimistic. The Americans um, tested well over night and they were waiting for a test this afternoon that might have cleared most of their team to be in the game against Sweden. So that was a big good bit of news to start off the day. Um, but then came news that the Czech Republic had one positive test and that one positive test would forfeit the Czech game against Finland and even at that point the International Ice Hockey Federation was prepared to soldier on and thought okay two so far we can keep going through this um, but when the Russian player tested positive in the Russian Slovakia game mm -hmm. had had to be cancelled and Russia had to forfeit it. At that point, the IIHF uh, Council got together with its medical committee and the medical committee, which consists of a lot of doctors and infectious disease experts, told the IIHF, this is probably going to happen every day. And it, the positivity rate in this group is far lower than what it is for the public. Right. But... If, if you get one test on one team on one day, then that team postpones and forfeits. And as you start running out of racetrack, getting to the January 2nd quarterfinal, there was just a feeling amongst the IIHF that they were fighting a losing battle and the integrity of the competition, the safety factor for people involved, snowball it all together. And one other thing that I don't believe has been reported, it's my understanding that as many as five on-ice officials, referees and linesmen, have tested positive, and that there was also concern that between now and the end of the tournament, would there be enough on-ice officials to officiate the games? So put it all together mm -hmm. in a big ball, and the common sense decision on the IIHS part was, we can't make this happen. So they believe they can't contain it. Because again, you, some people will look at this and say, that's only four positive tests. You, you have 25 man rosters, you could forge forward, even if there's a, one more positive test tomorrow or so on. Here's the problem, it's, it's the protocols. And so everybody kind of goes nuts when they hear the word protocol, because you've got one segment of society right now who looks at Omicron and says, eh, it's nothing more than a cold, don't even test, just let the kids play, away you go. Um, and then you've got another segment of society who says, it's ludicrous that th these kids are even here playing because everything should be locked down because we're in, in, in the second wave of a pandemic. Um, and obviously, the, the in-between position on that is you've got to come up with some protocols that make sense. Unfortunately, the whole Omicron thing has happened so rapidly that the protocols, you try to change the protocols to make them safer for the players, but making them safer for the players makes it near impossible to put on a game. So as a result, one person testing positive in a short period period of time cancels that game or forfeits mm -hmm. that game. That was true last year at the World Juniors. A lot of people don't realize that. They said, hey, what about Germany? They had like eight, nine guys tested positive. They tested positive the week before the tournament began. All the same protocols were in place last year, but there was a firm bubble as opposed to this year. And then people say, well, why didn't you have a firm bubble this year? And that's a good question. And maybe the IIHF will address that. But the short answer is that the whole Omicron thing really took on a life of its own from December 1st on. There probably wasn't the time to be able to put a firm bubble in place the, like they had last year that took literally months and months and months to put into place. So it is what it is, sort of, but the, the, the protocols are what caused a strict enforcement of, of what the medical authorities believed was necessary for the protection of these kids and for the general society at large. And, and we should say that there was no full bubble as there was last year, but most of the teams were acting in a virtual bubble as we were, where there were tests every day. It wasn't like people were, yeah, but teams the, were going out to restaurants and so on and so forth. No, but, but the, pl the players were in hotels that were open to the public. Right, and S that is, that that. is a I mean, different you're, situation. You're getting into an elevator and you're with yep. somebody who 
There, uh, is there it? is a statement uh, that has been released by Luke Tardif, the president of the Double IHF, and here is what it says: Together with the teams, we came into this event with full confidence in the COVID-19 protocols put in place by, by the Double IHF, the LSE Alberta Health, Alberta Health Services, and the Public Health Agency of Canada. The ongoing spread of COVID-19 and the Omicron variant forced us to readjust our protocols almost immediately upon arrival to attempt to stay ahead of any potential spread. This included daily testing and the team quarantine requirement when positive tests were confirmed. He goes on to say, we owed it to the participating teams to do our best to create the conditions necessary for this event to work. Unfortunately, this was not enough. We now have to take some time and focus on getting all players and team staff back home safely. Now, the next question will be, there is a, 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 a possibility, the cancellation is the word they are using, but is there a chance that in a couple of months, three months, that they reschedule this and there is a 2022 World Juniors? The, the IIHF policy is basically when something, when they decide to cancel something, they cancel it. And we saw the furor that was created, and understandably so, when the Women's Under-18 World Championship was cancelled, as opposed to the IIHF saying, oh, it's just postponed. We'll try and get it on later. So the host... The, the host country for the under-18 women's world said, we can't put this on, we're not able to put this on, we're out. And the IIHF says, okay, in that case, it is cancelled. Now, there was uh, understandable backlash to that, and among, among the number of federations that said, well, we might be interested in doing that, was USA Hockey amongst others, and the IIHF's position was, okay, fine, bring us a proposal, and we will look at that proposal, and if, we, if it makes sense and we can do it, then we will do it. And I would assume the exact same situation and policy of the IIHF is in place for that. They have cancelled the 2022 World Junior Championship. Hockey Canada is effectively the rights holder for the 2022 as the host. Mm -hmm. And that it'll be up to Hockey Canada initially to say, hmm, um, we, we, we want to try to put this on later. We'll try and find a way to do this. Um, but they haven't done that yet. I think right now, Hockey Canada's attitude is, let's just take a deep breath here. Um, their entire group is shell-shocked. The amount of work and effort it takes to put something like this on right. is literally months. And so they're like everybody else. They're, they're, they're just shell-shocked right now that all the work they've put in is gone. So they're going to take some time and see where they're at. And if there's a feasible way to do it, then they'll probably propose that to the IIHF. If there's not, then they won't. So right now, it's cancelled. And it's complicated to reschedule an event like this, to find a venue. There's junior leagues that have to go on, and college hockey, and NHL going on in arenas like this one. And, and for folks in Alberta wondering if they'll get another one, or whether the next one in Canada will be back here again, those decisions are still far off. Again, Hockey Canada still trying to digest everything. Uh, let's bring in the voices of the World Juniors, Gord Miller and Ray Ferraro. Uh, you really feel for these kids, particularly yeah. the 19-year-olds who, uh, some of them playing for Canada, Germany, Austria, no matter what the country is, that this was their one crack at the World Juniors. Yeah, and I think that, you know, to Bob McKenzie's point, uh, you know, you hope they get a chance at some point to play in it. We'll, we'll address that in a minute. And also, a, you know, the duty to care to the kids. I, I want to start, Ray, talking about how quickly events overtook this tournament. You think about the teams had to report in Alberta the second week of December. At right. that point, the NHL had postponed six games and was still going to the Olympics. Here we were two weeks later. The NHL's had 70 games and counting postponed, and they're not going to the Olympics. In the space of 12 days, everything changed. Well, you know, as Bob just pointed out, you're right, Gord, as, as things changed so quickly. Like, in retrospect, the only way this tournament was going to happen and happen successfully would have been for everybody to be fully bubbled. However, nobody really felt that was a, a possibility or a necessity as we were into late November. You can just imagine the enormity of the project, to bubble a hotel, to bubble the arena, to get the players food, to get them in and out of the arenas. There was just no time for it to happen. And as soon as I think we have the NHL as our example is with the rules the way they are, as soon as one player on a team gets Omicron, somebody else is getting it. It's right. it, the, the transmissibility has shown us that it's really almost impossible uh, to, to keep that contained. I got to say, I'm watching, I'm watching those guys, the, the trainers and stuff, uh, wheel the, the kids' equipment and stuff to the, you know, to the trucks to get it out of here. And 
man, I feel bad for those kids. You know, oh, we, yeah. we're talking about some kids, most kids in this tournament, there will be nothing bigger in their hockey career than this. And it's gone. And it's across society. I know it's across society, but we're sitting in an empty rink. We were here in in uh, March, I guess, of, of 2020 in, in Toronto. Yeah, we saw the You same. and I doing the same, basically the same show, except we knew a lot less. And I, I feel badly. I feel terrible yeah. for these kids. I feel terrible for the organizers, the people that put their time. Gord, we, we get shuttled back and forth. The volunteers that have put all their time and effort into this, the fans that put their hard-earned money out because they wanted to come and watch, it's all gone in an instant. So point number two here of three is that people ask, well, four cases, why aren't they playing on? And I, and I think one of the points that has to be made here, the IHF canceled six tournaments in January, uh, four women's under 18s right. and two men's under 20. And one of the reasons they did that was those are tournaments that by definition involve teenagers like this one. There is a duty to care. These, these are, in, in many cases, minors, and the IHF is responsible for them, and the organizers are responsible for them while they're here. And uh, to sit in the leadership seat to make the decision that you have to make, given the um, you know the the council that they uh, that they talk with the doctors' council and their medical people, it's an enormous responsibility, and it's got to be really difficult to sit there. I know there's lots of people that think, hey, look, nobody's really getting sick, generally speaking. Can we not just plow forward? And it's easy to say unless you have to make the decision. I can think that, but you might have to make that decision. There's a great difference. And how, as a parent, we're both parents, how would you feel if they, if they said, your child's going to keep playing? You know what, Gord? I bet you it's more divided than you think. It might be, yeah. Yeah, because, or not than you think. I think we, there's lots of people here that, you know, whose kids are involved, I'm sure, that are thinking, man, this is it. This was their only chance I'd... I'd like them to keep playing. However, the IHF doesn't have that luxury. So the third point I want to get to, and you had a great conversation on your podcast yesterday with Darren Drager yeah. with Luke Tardif, the president of the IHF. And one of the topics you discussed was the women's under-18 tournament that was canceled in January. So the process there was the IHF medical committee determined that it wasn't possible to hold those tournaments in January safely. There wasn't enough time to get everyone in early, do all the testing that would be required. The Swedes, who were hosting the women's under-18s, said, we can't do it after the Olympics. We don't have arena availability. We can't do right. it. So that's when Luke Tardif said to you, to you guys that if USA Hockey wants to do it, they can do it. But one of the things he talked about was how difficult it is to build these schedules. I believe that, some, that every avenue will be explored to play this tournament before the end of summer. I, I, re I believe that. I've mm -hmm. talked to a couple people that are not high up, but, but they think the same thing. It's too early today to, to think that. But Tardif had some really insightful things to say to you. He, he really did. Now, first off, he mentioned uh, in regards with those six cancellations that have already happened. Between now and the end of the Men's World Hockey Championship in Helsinki in May, they have to run 20 tournaments. There's already 20 tournaments Plus on Plus the it. Olympics. But yes, on the calendar already. There's, there's no time. However, he said the open window for the women's U18 was June, June and July. That's the time. So if they are going to reschedule it, you would think it would go with the same timeline for the World Junior Tournament. Maybe it's something in conjunction with the women's U18. I, you know, I mean, that's just speculation, but it, that's the time frame they would be able to do it. The other thing he made that he said that I thought was really critical is the difference between... I know it's semantics, but between postponing and canceling. Right. If you postpone the tournament, that means it all falls on the IIHF to do everything to fix it all. If you cancel and then someone like USA Hockey has come up and said, hey, we, we have an idea we can do this tournament, now you work in conjunction. It's a small difference. It's one word, but it means a lot to the IIHF. So... It's up to the United States now to come up with a proposal for the women's U18. As Bob mentioned, Hockey Canada is the rights holder here. It would be up to Hockey Canada to come up with a proposal. These are not easy. These are big decisions, uh, very complicated. But I'm with you, Gord. I, I think there is a way. I think there's a way. And the way Mr. Tardif mentioned that window of opportunity in June and July, that to me seems to be a place that this could be. So there's a lot to take in. But I think the point that you made right off the top is is – is this tournament is about the athletes. These yeah. these tournaments, these events are all about the athletes. And 
for all the talk about the money and rescheduling and, and, and everything else that goes with it, ultimately there's a lot of teenagers who were living a lifetime dream that have had it for now taken away. James? The reason this tournament is great, the reason we love this tournament so much is because the players care about it so much. And that passion translates to the ice, and that's why we get the greatest, most passionate hockey of the year in this tournament, and that's why it will hurt them so much that they don't get a chance to do this. Yeah, and, and I agree with everything Gordon Ray said and what you said. You feel bad for the kids in this tournament, but I, I, I feel bad for all the kids everywhere that have gone through this entire pandemic because we're talking of, you know, the under 18 women's worlds. I feel just as bad for them as I do for Absolutely. these kids here. I feel I live in Ontario. Nobody in Ontario played hockey last year. The Ontario mm -hmm. Hockey League didn't play any hockey. Kid, boys and girls of all ages played virtually no hockey, no semblance of a real league. When, when you think about the impact on the development of hockey players, but also on the development of young people who use sport as, as a way to, to become better rounded citizens. And, and, and that it's, it's catastrophic what the pandemic has cost all of these things. So there's the micro look at the World Juniors has been canceled today, but this is, this is a rolling story from, from before all the way to now. And what it, what it reinforces to me too, as we talk about this being a micro issue, is that this is a microcosm of what society is going to have to deal with in the days and weeks and months ahead. This variant is different than the Delta variant, different than the original one. Um, as I said off the top, there's two segments of extreme populations out there, and that is, this is nothing but a cold, just don't test anybody and let's live our lives and we're going to be fine. Well, that's all well and good, but if you look at the medical system and it might be collapsing and it's already teetering because of everything everybody went through and doctors and nurses got so fed up and so many of them have quit and retired and, and said that's it and enough nonsense. Um, so there's that element on the extreme end and then there's the other extreme says th these are terrible times and we better all pull the blankets over our head and we better lock everything down until this thing goes away. Well guess what? It isn't going away and Omicron is different than Delta. So. You see the NHL trying to figure its way out here. You see the CDC in the United States just reduce quarantine times to five days. Mm -hmm. Everybody is trying to figure out how to coexist because our mental health and our economy can't take a full lockdown, but our medical system can't take a, oh, you know what, it's just a cold. Go ahead. Don't even worry about it. Don't even test anybody. There's something in between, but every day it changes. The target keeps changing because... We don't have enough information yet on the variant. And so well, everyone wants to be black and white. Uh, if you do. go on social media yeah. and it's, it's either half, why did they even bother to try this tournament in the first place? And half, why are they stopping it right now? And the world is gr many shades of gray. It, it's, it's not black and white. And to what you said about hockey, let's extend to all other sports. You know, to volleyball players who had their provincials canceled, basketball, whatever it may be. This has been really tough on kids all the way up, university athletes and so on and so forth. We're just in the right here, right now with this World Junior Tournament. Let's bring in Craig Button, who, of course... Uh, uh, works on this tournament basically all year long, scouting for us, and he's been in Red Deer calling the games for us. Uh, one of the things we lose here is just, look, we were talking about what it means to all the players, but we would love watching this tournament because of what we see on the ice and uh, Mishkoff and what he was doing out in Red Deer and Jesper Wallstedt, the Swedish goaltender. And, you know, that's what we've lost today is seeing those great performances. And, and we have, and, and those players that uh, think about the World Juniors, and they know they're in the spotlight, James, and they love being in the spotlight. You, you started off this broadcast talking about why does this tournament mean so much? It's because the players care so much, and they do. I just watched the Slovakian team take a team picture. They were so excited about being here. They knew they had a good team. They were really good in their first two games, despite not winning those two games. They knew that they had a chance to do something that hasn't been done very much in Slovakian hockey. But you know what? They're, they were happy for even just the smallest of opportunity. 
we're all on the same mind. We feel for the players that are not going to have an opportunity to come back and participate in the World Junior Tournament. And, you know, everybody's going to try to make their best efforts to try to have a platform, to have a landscape where there can be a World Junior Tournament that can be completed this year. You know, the, the hockey calendar gets in the way. We talk about the prospects. NHL teams have development camps. We have the draft coming up. You start to go into the new cycle. There's not, it's not impossible to reschedule the tournament. Tournament, but there are some real challenges in doing it and what we got to do is, is just put our minds together come up with ideas debate them discuss them and figure out if it can be done or not because ultimately these teams the coaches the organizers the players they've been preparing for this since the summertime some of them have been thinking about it since they were at the tournament last year Cole Perfetti who loses in the gold medal game wants an opportunity to come back and win Players that want to show the scouts what they're capable of doing. They get a little bit of an opportunity. Some other players, maybe last chance to show what they can do going into their draft, don't get that opportunity. So, you know, the disappointment is profound. It's widespread. And the efforts that go into this by so many people, so many people that we don't even know about or hear about, is such a sacrifice. And I feel for everybody in that regard also. The perfect solution would be to hold the women's U18 somehow in conjunction with the World Junior. Uh, mm -hmm. That would be in, in a dream scenario. But you know the sked better than anybody else and what you were talking about with you know, players in NHL camps and such. Is, is June, does June make the most sense after the Memorial Cup is done and NCAA is all done? Obviously, you're competing with the Stanley Cup playoffs at that point. But is that the only window that potentially makes some sense? It makes sense, James. So so what I would say is, okay, so now w let's explore what that means. Okay, yeah, the Stanley Cup playoffs are going on, but you know what? There, there's also an opportunity to, have to, to showcase the players. You know, when we saw what happened in March 2020 with the shutdown around the world, you know, all of a sudden we're thinking, okay, what does this mean? We didn't know. But all of a sudden people put their minds together and they came up with ideas. And we came up with the solution and the return to play in the NHL of the bubble. And, you know, that was a solution. Whoever thought that we would be handing out a Stanley Cup in September? But find a way. Think about different ways to do it. So, yes, we know that the schedule can be tight, and certainly in an Olympic year, but that window that you point out is there because there's less stress on other leagues. The OHL doesn't have to sacrifice players. European uh, teams are done. And, yes, you're leading into the draft, and, yes, the Stanley Cup playoffs are there, but it seems that that might be the very best time for player availability. So, James, count me on board to jump on this idea and try to find a way to contribute to it happening. All right, that is Craig Button from Red Deer. Appreciate all your work all year long getting ready for these World Juniors. Hopefully we'll get to do it again sometime, uh, perhaps in the spring. Here is a joint statement from Scott Smith and Tom Rennie of Hockey Canada. Since the beginning of the pandemic, we have always made the health and safety of event participants and the community at large a priority. And given the news that we have encountered positive cases within the World Juniors environment, we understand and support the decision to cancel the remainder of the event. Although we know this is the right decision, we sympathize with all the participants who have earned the opportunity to represent their countries on the world stage, and that will not be able to realize that dream in its entirety. Let's bring in our Ryan Rashog. The tournament canceled today, but I guess one could argue that it was wounded beforehand. The fact that when it went to 50% capacity and, and Ryan, it never really got to 50% capacity, that the, the energy that you would usually see at a World Juniors in Canada really wasn't here. Is that fair? Oh, that's absolutely fair, James. I mean, consider nine games played and total attendance at just over 22,000. When you think about what capacity actually is, even after being cut to 50%, uh, listen, you know, I've talked to some tournament sources and people who were charged with trying to sell this thing. You know, before the government cut attendance back to 50%, there were over 13,000 packages, tickets sold for Canada's games, and even more in the medal rounds. So sales were actually viewed to be going really well. Well, then the Alberta government cuts capacity back to 50%. That put them in a position where they had to give people the option to, to give their packages back or to hold on to them. And I can tell you, James, that the most they were able to get into this building was just over 4,000 for one of Canada's games. Uh, it was just a, a witch's brew of worst-case scenario when you consider the 50% capacity, 
You couple that with the fact that they weren't allowed to have food and beverages. So if your parents thinking about bringing your kids, I mean, how tough is that to do when you can't do the popcorn and you can't do those things? Uh, you know, it's been minus 20 to minus 30 here, and that plays a factor. I know they, they did some outreach to the fans since the start of the tournament to get a sense of where fans' heads were at and, and maybe why sales were slow, and those were some of the main reasons that they mentioned. Not, not to mention, James, that... You know, COVID, no Omicron, the numbers have spiked. And for those who have concerns about that, that's just going to have people stay home. So, you know, last year's bubble for Hockey Canada uh, and for, you know, the IIHF to put this event on, you know, that would have cost a lot of money to have done that. And this year, holding it here in Edmonton in this building uh, with the capacity that it has was a way to try and make good on some of that. And not that the important decisions are made based on money, but this was a year to make good on that. And it's very fair to say that this tournament was heavily wounded uh, before it really got off the ground from an attendance standpoint so it's something they were working madly behind the scenes to try and figure out and try and fix but listen we saw in this building James that we've covered a lot of world juniors in North America here in Canada particularly and we've never seen anything attendance wise like what we saw here and as understandable as it is given the circumstances the popcorn and the beer you're allowed to say the beer Ryan it, yeah. is, it is Canada <laughs> they miss that in here as well um, one more question and this is far down the lines of priority but for hockey nerds like us, what happens to the stats and the games that were played? What happens to Connor Bedard's yeah. four-goal game or the play of Wallstadt, the Swedish goaltender, and his shutout or Mishkov's three goals? What happens to those numbers? Yeah, it's a great question, and I don't think anything firm uh, has been decided at this point because obviously that's going to be down on the priority list. We did reach out to the IIHF just to because we were wondering some of the same things, and the early word that we got back is that because all the teams were able to get to at least a game in and because these games actually happened and there is precedent for it that the likelihood is uh, these statistics and these records will remain so for Connor Bedard what a an amazing performance it was for him uh, it sounds like there's a very good chance that will stay on the record books but again uh, nothing confirmed at this point those decisions will be made after some other really important decisions are made in the days to come James all right good stuff Ryan uh, let's get to unfortunately one of the unluckiest people in this World Juniors this year, and that would be our Mark Masters, who Mark tested positive, uh, I guess, last night, Mark, or was it this, this morning, in the test from yesterday, is that correct? Yes, I test. I would have tested yesterday. The test result came back this morning, and uh, that's, that's the call I got this morning. Well, I think that it's clear that when Mark Masters couldn't go, they had to cancel the tournament, right? That's That's... Masters Nation, it can't go on. Uh, and so you'll be st you, you'll be stuck in your hotel room for the next 10 days in Edmonton. Is that correct with the protocols? That's the isolation period here. So, yeah, uh, and I was, of course, uh, I was so disappointed uh, to test positive, but was looking forward to, to having some good hockey to watch. And uh, so just a tough day all around. How are you feeling? Mild symptoms, I guess. I think it's it's maybe consistent with with what others are going through. Uh, chills, uh, sore throat. It's gotten progressively worse today, day one, I suppose. So, uh, nothing too terrible. I'll be all right, but uh, but uh, just a disappointing day. I uh, want to say, by the way, uh, for everybody out there who doesn't know it, and most viewers do, nobody works harder at this World Juniors than Masters, who not only do you see him on the air doing those reports, but every single day from the moment camp opens sends us a short novel on everything that is going on with Team Canada that you can find on tsn.ca. So uh, before this tournament and we, we depart here, we, we really appreciate everything you've done. And uh, we were talking briefly with Ryan uh, Bedard versus Mishkov, and it would have been so fun to see potentially a quarterfinal or a semifinal or a gold medal game between those two, wouldn't it have been? It would have been amazing. I mean, uh, you talk about my notes and my Sports Center coverage. Uh, I, I was going to have a doozy today. I felt really good about it. Uh, <laughs> talked to John Paddock, uh, the Regina Pats head coach, uh, to get his perspective on Connor Bedard and how he wasn't surprised at all that this kid was doing what it, what what he's doing. He actually was mostly surprised that Bedard had a hat trick at the World Juniors before the Western Hockey League. He's like, that's amazing and somewhat surprising. And he's he had a great uh, tournament before the news broke. We talked to Mason McTavish and Kent Johnson, uh, Ryan 
Brian Rashog and I did on a Zoom call, and they were just gushing about this guy. You know, Kent Johnson said he dominated a game at age 16 at the World Juniors. He was the best player on the ice. Uh, Mason McTavish compared a shot to Austin Matthews and said he was trying to get pointers from him. This is a guy who played in the NHL this year. So, I mean, Connor Bedard was doing something special. Mitchkov, too. They played in that pre-tournament game. They both were, were really noticeable there. We were kind. I was kind of hoping for a for a medal round showdown between those two. And one thing Paddock told me was the hype around Bedard. Is, I asked him if he, you know, could he compare it to anything, and he said when he was coaching the Winnipeg Jets in the early 90s and Tamu Solani had 76 goals as a rookie, he said that's kind of the hype that he feels around Bedard. And then he said it's only going to get greater. So I can only imagine what it will be like at the next World Juniors in Russia, uh, Mikov versus Bedard, uh, with them both even a year stronger and better. It's, uh, it's at least something exciting to look forward to on a tough day like this. Yeah, we've been accused at times of overhyping players at the World Juniors. These two guys are every bit as worthy. Uh, Mark, stay well. Uh, we'll be thinking about you and appreciate everything you've done. Here are the numbers on Bedard and Mishkov. Bedard, of course, with the natural hat trick and four goals, uh, tying a Canadian record in this tournament, five points overall. And Mishkov as well was just getting started. Three goals, three points in two games for Russia. And so there you have it. The 2022 World Juniors canceled. We are not done here today. The IIHF has scheduled a news conference for later on. We will carry that live and have more reaction from here. But uh, it's over way too early. It is. Uh, it's really unfortunate. It's a great hockey tournament, but it's over. And as I said earlier, um, this isn't a hockey story. This is a society story. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of people at home right now wondering if their kids are going back to school next week. Everybody, all the levels of government, all the health authorities, everybody, employers, employees, everybody across the board are trying to find their way through these new choppy waters that is a highly transmissible um, uh, virus that's not seemingly as devastatingly, you know, the, the symptoms aren't as bad as they were prior. But again, we're not medical experts, so everybody's trying to figure their way through it. And as you do that, it seems to change every day what the rules are or aren't. And because we aren't medical experts, we can all guess, but in the end, you have to defer to the medical experts. And in this case, this is what the IIHF has done. Once again, 4.30 p.m. local time here in Alberta will be the news conference, 6.30 p.m. Eastern, 3.30 Pacific for the IIHF. And we'll have much more ahead on the next edition of SportsCenter one half hour from now. The 2022 World Juniors have been canceled.